Thank you very much for joining me for this talk. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Toronto and the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm also the associate director at the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. Along with our director, Gillian Hadfield, it has been my pleasure to organize this series on AI and government. Artificial intelligence is here. In this final lecture, I want to do two things. First, I want to briefly review what we've learned in this series, and perhaps in doing that, to encourage you to watch some of the earlier lectures that you might have missed. And second, I want to say some important things about the future of AI and government. When I do that, I'll share with you three important insights about the impact of AI on your work, on what will be valued in public service, and on the future of democracies versus autocracies. But first, let's start with what we've learned. We've explored contemporary approaches to artificial intelligence and how they represent a form of learning by computers or machines that does not require constant human direction. AI is a new technology, unlike previous forms of computing. In a traditional computer program, every line of code is written by a human and tested by human experts. We know who's responsible if something goes wrong. But with modern AI techniques, such as machine learning, the computer writes its own rules. As a result, it's not easy to see or understand why the AI is doing what it is doing. We don't have the same control over it. It's therefore much more challenging to figure out how to hold humans responsible for its outcomes. We need new regulatory frameworks and practices, both to enable and regulate the use of this new technology. This is especially challenging because the technology is moving so quickly, much faster than we can write new legislation. If we're going to be successful in regulating AI, we need to think differently about how we craft and implement policy in order to develop innovative approaches that match the speed and complexity of the task at hand. Next, we learn that government and public forms of decision-making impose special obligations on the use of AI. Governments have to make a large number of decisions in a way that is consistent with policy goals, is procedurally fair, and provides opportunities for learning and feedback. These challenges are faced by every department. They're collective and they're organizational. And solving them within the public service depends not on ignoring AI, but on tackling these problems head on. Government needs the consent of citizens for everything it does. And we learn that the use of algorithms in government poses particular challenges for citizen consent, and it does so for four key reasons. First, citizens support many different reasons for the use of algorithms in government, but they don't support a single coherent set of justifications yet. In fact, support for the use of algorithms by government often varies along partisan and ideological lines, and those need to be bridged if we're to experience wider usage of AI. Second, Citizens have a status quo bias that leads them to evaluate algorithmic innovations negatively. Citizens, almost as a matter of habit, prefer the way decisions are made now to how they might be made better in the future. Third, citizen trust in algorithms develops independently of how well those algorithms perform. Citizens are harsh judges of algorithms, and they're unlikely to extend them the deep trust that they do to human decision makers. And finally, opposition to algorithmic government is higher among those who fear the broader effects of automation and AI. In other words, it's tied up in broader debates about what the future of technology and society will be. We next dug into the risks and opportunities of using AI in different circumstances, whether it's assisting or replacing human decision makers, and whether it's being used internally in government or in a public facing way. We explored regulatory responses to these uses and how the predictive power of AI can be used to support decision-making processes of public servants, enabling them to focus on decisions that require greater judgment, nuance, and even empathy. We then zoomed out, exploring the broader uses and implications of AI. Avi Goldfarb taught us about how AI is broadly transforming the economy by giving us faster, cheaper, more accurate predictions. Importantly, this increases the value of other things, like good human judgment, in areas where machines cannot perform as well. Julian Hadfield provided us with a deeper legal understanding of how bias, fairness, and transparency matter for AI, in practice and in the law. She gave us a framework for justifiable AI, which is something different and better than the explainable AI that we hear so much about. 
And finally, we got a global view of AI, first through Phil Dawson's lecture about the global effort to regulate the use of AI, and secondly, through Janice Stein's masterclass on the promise and perils of AI in foreign policy. As Dawson notes, dozens of countries have put forward efforts to regulate AI, and they've used remarkably consistent approaches. Are these working? They will not, unless there's widespread international cooperation to make these regulations testable and coherent. And the private sector is waiting on governments to regulate AI because they want a common regulatory framework before they invest in all of the gains that can be unlocked by wider use of AI. As Professor Stein showed us, using the case of the United States exit from Afghanistan in 2021, there is major work to be done in effectively employing artificial intelligence in our foreign policy. Nonetheless, it forms a major part of many countries' emerging foreign policy strategies. AI is imperfect and complicated, but it's surely here now. What then is the future of artificial intelligence in government? I know this question is on the minds of many of you who have listened to and participated in earlier sessions. You've asked questions like, what will the use of AI government mean for my job? How will it change it? Will I still have a place? Is there a role for anyone but data scientists and programmers? Will government actually be better if we use algorithms and machine learning? And how should government be thinking about how to use and regulate AI in a way that is consistent with democratic values and the values of the public service? Of course, the answers to these questions are hard to come by because the future is inherently uncertain and in some cases even unknowable. But having thought about this for some time, I thought I might share with you three sets of insights and maybe dare I say predictions about the future of artificial intelligence in government. The first insight has to do with what we might call the distributional fact of artificial intelligence. That is, the use of artificial intelligence is likely to be spread across many tasks and jobs rather than concentrated entirely in a few. And we'll talk about what that means for the public service. The second insight is based upon what we might call the values premium or the increased importance of values and principles in public decision making. And finally, the third insight is what we might call the democratic advantage. That is, the use of artificial intelligence and algorithmic government will be different and better in democracies than it will be in autocracies. I'd like to go through each of these insights in turn and then at the end, share one final insight about the unique nature of the public service and why I think this sector is perhaps more ready than any other organization, any other sector, to effectively and ethically employ artificial intelligence. Let me start first though with you, the public servant. What is the future of a public servant at a time when more and more jobs can be automated? I appreciate the fear you might feel here, and you're not alone. In fact, when I surveyed thousands of Canadians in 2019 and asked them about whether they expected to lose their job to a computer or a machine, 10% said that they expected to do so in the next five years and fully a quarter expected to have their job replaced by a computer or machine within the decade. These fears were not limited, I must say, to those working in manufacturing or manual labor positions. But are these fears well-founded? Well, the answer depends in good part on how we think AI-driven automation will be rolled out and incorporated into organizations. Here, I think the distributional fact of technology is important. And what is that fact? It's that for nearly all jobs, some parts can be automated, but in nearly no jobs can all parts be automated. Let me tell you what I mean. When we surveyed Canadians in 2019 about their views and fears over automation, we also asked them detailed questions about their jobs. Not only what their jobs were, but what tasks their work involved. Does your work involve following instructions closely? Does it involve talking to other people? Does it involve navigation, manual labor? communicating through writing, etc. And once we figure out what tasks make up a person's job, we can then get a better grasp of what share of the things they do could be automated using what technologists call currently demonstrable technology. And what do we find? Well, for the average Canadian respondent, 65% of the tasks they perform are currently performed by machines at a median level of about 50%. In other words, for about two thirds of the things we do in our jobs, a computer could replace that task with equal performance only about half the time. That hardly seems like a good bargain if you're buying robots. 
On the other hand, 93% of our respondents have at least one task in their current occupation for which current technology performs in the top quartile of human performance. Or in other words, about 90% of people have some task which a computer can do better than 75% of uh, humans. So nearly everyone then is at least partially exposed to automation and AI. So this is the distributional fact. Nearly all of us could replace some of the things we do with automation, but important parts would inevitably remain. Now, what if those tasks we could replace are the ones we do not enjoy, or the ones that cause us stress, or perhaps most importantly, the ones we really do not do all that well, while well, we keep the functions that are most important to us, and even more crucially, are important to the larger purposes of our work. Suddenly, the implementation of AI appears as less of a threat, and more as a welcome innovation that can generate greater efficiency, like the shift from typewriters to computer word processing, paper and pen-based ledgers to spreadsheets, or card catalogs to database software. The second probable future of AI, maybe especially in the public service, is what we might call the values premium. Artificial intelligence is, in one very well-regarded telling, a form of prediction technology. It is an efficient and potentially ever-improving system for predicting the probable outcome from an action, using information that we have about the past. This is a remarkably promising technology then, if our goal is to determine who is most likely to succeed as a selected immigrant, to estimate whether a tax return is in fact covering up a fraud or is honest, or to determine if an EI applicant might be faster to return to work if offered some customized micro-credential. What these prediction machines are not good at determining, are not good at understanding, is how the humans who are involved in and observe these decisions will understand and interpret them. Will they find these decisions justifiable? Will they accept the reasons given for selecting one outcome over another? Will they trust the machine in the future to make more decisions on their behalf? Why does this matter? It matters precisely because in these complex social systems we live in, that's a fancy way of saying society, the values and reasons that underwrite our decisions and actions matter as much as the decisions and the actions themselves. And this is more important, I might venture, in decisions made in and by governments than those made in the private sector. How does this matter for the future of AI? It matters because the main protectors of those values and principles will not be machines, and will almost certainly not be those writing directives from the top of an organizational pyramid. It will instead be those who put these decisions into action, what others have sometimes called street-level bureaucrats. It's here where there will be a premium on values like trust, transparency, and decency. It's this final principle of decency that I'd like to spend a minute on. In his seminal work, The Decent Society, Marguerite asks us to consider the following scenario. Suppose there's a truck delivering food to people in a village during a famine. From the back of the truck, each villager is handed a loaf of bread, enough to fill their stomach at least for the day. Isn't this a generous and noble act? And what does it say about the people delivering the bread? Aren't they generous and noble people? But now consider a slight change. Suppose those delivering the bread, instead of handing it out, throw it on the ground, so that villagers have to scramble for it in the dust. They all get a loaf in the end, and their hunger is sated to the same degree. Why is this different? It's different because it isn't decent. It's different because it involves a humiliation. The decent society is one in which people are not humiliated. I don't want to overstate the case here, but I do want to make it strongly. Government is too often an impersonal organization, one for which many citizens' experiences are of indifference, if not contempt. There's a real risk that this experience of indifference will become even more common as more decisions and allocations are left to the seeming caprices of an algorithm. The important job of public servants in this context is to put a great premium on the values of trust, transparency, and decency, on humanity, you could say to make sure that AI is enhancing the human element of public service, rather than completely draining it from the system. My third point, which is not my own, but that of my colleague Henry Farrell, is that the more governments employ algorithmic decision-making and artificial intelligence, the more stark the differences between democracies and autocracies will become. The basic idea is this. We're wrong to think that artificial intelligence and machine learning deployed at scale 
will make countries like China some sort of technocratic leviathan, ready to outperform and eventually eclipse democracies. We're wrong, in short, to think that employing AI and other technologies will make autocracies stronger. In fact, there's good reason to believe that the implementation of AI will amplify their weaknesses. The core problem of autocracies has always been an inefficient feedback mechanism in which the public can express its dissatisfaction to the state. In the place of the feedback provided by democratic engagement, autocratic states seek control of citizens. Rather than receiving the real and organic expression of happiness or discontent among citizens, the autocratic state imposes an order and assumes that as long as things are working, even minimally, then everyone is happy. But in this system, the inherent shortcomings of AI the multiple op op opportunities for biases to enter into the process and lack of value alignment in those processes will amplify these blind spots of the state, leading to more discrimination of some groups and more repression and perhaps less outside dissent, breaking down further the one static feedback mechanism these states have. Democracies are far from perfect, but they do have a built-in advantage. Democracies invite self-criticism they create incentives for groups who are marginalized or disadvantaged to mobilize against that marginalization or disadvantage, to point to solutions, and to make political and legal claims to correct those imbalances. This makes decision-making cumbersome, certainly, but it also makes it self-correcting. This feature is what will give democracies the advantage as we try to work out the best ways to employ AI and other technologies for social good in the future. Importantly, it's also the right reason for us to advocate for maximum transparency and explainability, for justifiability in the public use of AI, precisely so it can be more easily critiqued and corrected. Having said all of this about the future of AI, let me say something in particular about the public service. I know government is sometimes viewed as a laggard, behind on the latest trends, management practices, fads, and innovations. This is sometimes a fair criticism, but other times it's quite off base. But on AI, I believe the following is true. Democratic public services are perhaps more culturally ready for the adoption of AI than any other organization because public services have been set up like human assisted artificial intelligence systems for a very long period of time. Let me explain. The work of many public servants is to be part of a prediction machine to be presented with a problem, to formulate and test multiple solutions using the data at hand, to make recommendations which move through a series of considerations or algorithms, and to eventually reach a human who makes a choice over a small number of options. The human cannot see all of the deliberations that have led to the decision, but they can know the process, and they can know the values that guided that process. And they have an obligation to be able to defend and explain not only the decision, but how it was arrived at. All of these elements map onto a well-designed system of human-assisted and assisting artificial intelligence. If this is true, then AI can find productive and ethical uses in government, as much as in the private sector, and maybe even especially in democratic governments. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.